welcome into the Section 109 podcast from Studio Breezy, kind of. Uh, we are virtual, Matthew. It is that season where you are never home, and I am super busy, and so we are going to squeeze in a game recap here. Uh, we have a 40-minute time limit, but maybe we'll, because there's two games, sneak a little over it. But I'm here with uh, a Baba Juan right here, uh, unopened, sitting on my desk. It always is, if you look in the background, actually. And um, yeah, vibe check, Matthew, before we get straight into two games we have to review, Huntsville and the Miami United uh, Open Cup. How you feeling? How's work? How's life? Life, work, good. Uh, just, you know, being up here, doing my job. Uh, sucks that I missed uh, the game last night, but that's that's life. That, yeah, why that are happens you a this time of year. Why are you a bad fan? I just, I, I don't know, man. I don't know. But I will I will hear nothing. I will hear nothing about the crowd size from the onlookers on social media, because if I'm fairly engaged person can't be there for whatever reason, like what are what are people that are a little bit more casual than me? Like, of course, come on, fairly engaged. Also, just for the future, you, Jamie and Eric are not allowed to be gone on the same fucking night. You assholes. Um, Oh, yikes. (laughs) Listen, it went it actually went great because like uh, Ellie crushed it and. Vic was also gone. Uh, I don't know where he was either. I think he might have had to work or something. But anyway, it, we were running a skeleton crew, uh, but George and Sean and Bill Bolin in the back uh, and others, but like those three in particular, powered the fuck through. So back row bastards were doing their thing and Timmy and a bunch of other people. But um, yeah, it was it was fun. Uh, that was last night. Vibes are uh, not quite as high today as we would like them to be, I, I feel like. Uh, but that's what losing does. And uh, I'll just say before we get there, we've been on the other side of this, guys. Like, this is the magic of the cup. Sometimes underdogs win. And it sucks. Anyway, yeah, let's go to Huntsville I think first. Let's, let's go to Huntsville yeah. first. So Huntsville on Saturday, MLS Next Pro regular season opener. And uh, let's go ahead and, and just say... It, it finished two two, uh, with with the good guys winning three to two on penalties. We did not need to take our fourth or my, our fifth penalty because uh, of the John Burke save. What the hell are we calling it? Are we saying we won? I don't think we can say that. I think we have to say t- we we tie we drew, but we got an extra point. So I've been describing it to people. And I think this is a real question. Like I've been describing it to people. It's a stupid rule. I want to be clear. This is a stupid rule, and I don't like it. However, this is the MLS. We are playing in MLS Next Pro. They are experimenting with rules. They're going to continue to experiment. So these are the rules that we have, which is if, if you weren't paying attention or you didn't know, no big deal. Here's what they are. Just like hockey, if a game finishes in a draw after 90 minutes, it is one point for each team, and then you go to penalties, which they're calling spot kicks, but they are penalty kicks, and the winner of the penalty kick shootout gets an extra point. So you get it can get two points out of the game, and the other, the other gets one. So, But it's not a win, because a win would be three points. So I would call it a, a draw with a shootout victory for an extra point. Yeah, I, that might be... That, that, denotes the, that denotes the first point from the draw, and then the second point from the shootout victory. Um, want to shoot, I don't know. We'll figure, we'll figure that out with some time. Want to shoot out to get an extra point. Yeah. So let's go through the lineup real quick. Uh, Jonathan Burke started in goal. Jesse Williams at right back. Anatoly Prepolitsa at, at right center back. I'm so proud Logan of your pronunciation Brown. of Anatoly, by the way. It's come such a long way. <laughs> Logan Brown at left center back. Joseph Perez at left back. Uh, Andres Jimenez Aranzazu at the six. Alex McGrath and Luis Garcia Sosa at the 210 positions. Milo Garvanian at right wing. Taylor Gray at left wing. And then Ethan fucking Corrin. Ethan motherfucking Corrin. Uh, a holding midfielder converted to center back for the past two seasons, playing motherfucking nine striker. It was wild. Matthew, it was- how. We're not even, we didn't even, we're so shocked about Ethan playing that we haven't even talked about. We have a left back playing on the wing. Yeah. So all of this is really like, I, I think the entire, both Saturday and, and honestly, Tuesday night, like this all needs to be read like through a specific lens, mm. which, uh, which is like, uh, you know, Duben Viafara, P1 visa. He subbed in very, very, very late for, for stoppage time, you've got, uh, you know, Callum Watson got got a, a 78th minute sub against Huntsville. Medi Omri got a 79th minute sub versus Huntsville. Jude Arthur's not even in the country yet. There's a lot of 
Like there's a lot of missing pieces going on. Carlos Rivas doesn't have his ITC. Jean Antoine is still uh, out with his international injury. his international transfer clearance uh, from from his signing because he played for a Colombian club previously. So he needs his ITC before he can be registered here. So there's a lot of still moving pieces. Uh, whether like you know players have been here for a week or two or or, or practicing and are fully fit, just waiting to get cleared. There's a lot of stuff still going on. And one thing that I really appreciate about what Rod did uh, with this particular lineup, and, and it, it, in large ways it reprises on, on Tuesday in the Open Cup, is if you are not 90 minutes fit, you are not starting. Uh, and he, by the way, he broke that rule a little bit with Callum in the, uh, in the Open Cup game. Uh, but like the process, the Rod sess matters so much more than, you know, than looking good in the first 60 minutes of a match at the beginning of the season. There was a longer play here, and it's simply irresponsible to take players who are assets, by the way, for the club. They are are assets. It is irresponsible to deploy them in such a way that might bring them a better chance of getting injured because they're just not fit enough. And that led to a left back playing at right wing, uh, something I don't think he's done in five, six years. Well, I mean, and I, that, Ethan Corrin playing playing striker. So the striker thing is a hundred percent exactly what you said. The left wing thing, uh, or right wing thing, right wing thing, is uh, because we have a bunch of injuries. Um, right. Yeah. So, so it if is you look fitness at... related, but it's not unlike the other ones. All of our other ones are P one visa or long term injury, like Jean Antoine. Um, all the P ones. But you have some just preseason injuries as well. Um, I mean, Jesus Abar gets subbed out of the Birmingham match with a with did his hamstring in some way. Uh, Jalen uh, Jalen James gets subbed out early on in the season ticket holders match because of a concussion. Those are long recovery periods, and if you're still in the process of building fitness, exactly. Uh, but from also, the beginning of preseason, it's you not get just set back a lot. I, I, I agree that it's also fitness, but it's also just like if you have an injury and you play for a really long period, there's a chance you re-exacerbate that injury as well. So right. it's like for and, that and winger position it, was was just rough. And Damien, you forgot you didn't even mention Damien, who got hurt at some point. Cool. Uh and we don't know exactly when, but we do know he's hurt. Like, man, that's we're just in a tough spot with injuries right now. And that yeah. that that is a yeah. story. I'll, I'll, that's a story of actually both of these games. I think um, is that we're down essentially six starters in one, and you could argue five in the second one. Probably probably another probably another six in, in the uh, in the in the win the Tuesday game. Like I'll, I'll note that we only made three subs against Huntsville. You got Abara and 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 Jalen James back on Tuesday night, which is really important. But you you can tell that Rod waited to make that sub for the, I mean, it was 80th minute. So it was last 10 minutes, whatever stoppage time happens. And then maybe if you, if you, if you nick an equalizer, you're looking at 30 more minutes. Uh, So like very clearly, like, you know, intentionally did not play him against Huntsville to try to give him a little extra time uh, to build fitness ahead of Tuesday. And they still were minutes limited. Um, And, and and that's why you get, you know, Milo and Ethan starting again at, you know, at, at, at your, at two of your, you know, attacking positions. So let's, let's go through real quick, the goals against Huntsville, talk about the game a little bit, and then we'll, we'll, you know, move on to the open cup. I'm just going to pull the shade of this um, window closed because it's shining in my right eye. You're good. I'll, I'll just keep going here. So the first goal um, of the, of the next pro season, the first goal for, for Taylor Gray in 11 months comes in the 41st minute. Uh, it's just a, a big ball from from Logan Brown. Uh, we went direct towards the wingers at times. A big ball from Logan Brown. Taylor Gray wins the header on on, on the outside back, and is able to to collect the, the the kind of the second ball and and shoot it past the center back, and just has enough time uh, against the recovering Huntsville defense to slip it into the the bottom corner. And we take a one nil lead in, in into the halftime it's break. Such, it's such a smart finish too. Like the, the the individual skill to keep control of the ball and do all the things is wonderful and great. But to take that early with the outside of his foot before the, that was the last, defender gets that was, there, it's the last, that was the possible last opportunity time he, he has. had. It's perfect, and that also shows some growth in Taylor's game. Which in the, his first season here, it felt like 
he got he either missed or he got the last right for the last touch or or just wide or whatever like it felt like he just had that last little bit and look it's one goal but we saw the first five games of last year where taylor was our best and most important player in those first five games then he got hurt it's one league game but he was very clearly very very good and that is a small sign it is not a guarantee but that encourages me and makes me excited for his play this season coming out of halftime um Huntsville is able to, to to get the ball in a nice crossing position. And a whip cross comes in. John Burke puts his hands on it. It slides through his hands, and there's a Huntsville attacker uh, just just in the right place, right time. Just pokes that thing home. We go one one. Uh, you know, not not too much happens on our end in in the next in the next stretch uh, up until we make a you know we make the subs for Callum in the 78th and Medi in the in the 79th. And I think Medi's inclusion changes the, the game entirely. Our, our, all of a sudden, our ability, and this is no shot at, at Ethan Corrin, like Ethan Corrin's doing a job and like not one that he's suited for, but like that's just what we needed at the time. Like Medi is an actual real center forward and plays like one and his ability to, to back a guy down and and be a target and be able to retain possession and then get it out of his feet and then get on like you know spin and get on his on his wheels allowed us to just get some numbers forward and attack but also allowed us to to get into some more higher leverage positions and it culminates not very long after his inclusion with earning a penalty that Alex McGrath converts to go up to one yeah yeah uh, did, and then did you mention the part where Ethan Corn scored <laughs> I did not know because it didn't count. That was first half. Yeah, yeah, but but uh, I I I know I stepped away for about five seconds, but I didn't know if you had had did that. Um, I do think there's a very very fun time alternate alternative timeline where that ball is not out of bounds, uh, and he scores. So yeah, Ethan did not just the job. Honestly, like he made all the running and the challenging. Like he looked good in that first game. Not good for a striker, but I mean good for what I would have expected a non-striker playing that position. Like offensively, yes, Absolutely. he left some to be desired. But like overall, he did not hold us back in that Huntsville game in the same way uh, that I might have expected where he would have been like a, you know, if you, when you play a center back and striker, like you imagine they're just holding down the team. So he didn't do that. And that is a, a serious, serious credit to his name. The uh, the second Huntsville goal uh, comes in an interesting period where uh, Logan Brown goes down and the trainer comes on and it activates the the rule where if if you if you get trainer assistance on the field you have to be off the field for two three minutes whatever it is and you know we we slow playing down a man and um you know no, Huntsville has some numbers forward we come down with a, I think it was from a cross or something like that. You know, Alex McGrath at the top of the box collects the ball, starts to turn up field to try to, to break pressure and gets his pocket picked, you know, quick pass and a shot. Fabulous freaking finish uh, from from Huntsville's Ollie Wright makes it 2-2. And, you know, uh, and then we go into stoppage time. Dupan comes in uh, as a sub uh, for Logan Brown. There's there's some chances on on for both ends. Uh, in that one, probably a little bit more more so for Huntsville. You can tell that we're we're gassed and hanging on, but there was one real interesting opportunity. Uh, McGrath gets the ball in a bit of a break, and he finds the head of Medi, who puts the ball just agonizingly wide, just barely wide of the post. Um, and over top, I think. Just, and it's just right. It almost nicks just, off the top it, of the it's post. Right, it's right at that. It's right at that top corner. Right at that top corner. Uh, which would have which would have potentially won won the game for us. Um, so game game ends two two. We go to the shootout. Uh, Jonathan Burke comes up big on the first on the first save. Uh, McGrath is saved on his penalty uh, in in the shootout. And then Jonathan Bolaños for Huntsville skies his 
uh, with By the way, with deep respect for the academy kids with their shirts off, that, who definitely led him astray on that also, one. Also, John Burke goes, I think, the correct direction on that. So I'm giving all the credit to John Burke and the, <laughs> and the academy kids for doing the absolute best. So the kids are all right, Matthew, was my takeaway from this Absolutely. game. Because I did not expect to see academy children uh, lining the fence there going crazy shirtless, waving their, their shirts during the Huntsville penalties and then during the CFC penalties, putting their shirts back on and just being cool. Uh, amazing. Amazing. The children are right. And, and, the, and the wildest thing is, a lot of times in stadium, the shenanigans are the Chad hooligans. Like, it's us doing the shenanigans, whatever it is. This time, it, we had nothing to do with it. And that just makes me so happy and so um, encouraged. Keep going. Uh, so Anatoly makes this penalty. Joseph Perez makes his penalty. Duvet and makes his penalty. It, it's three, two at this point. And, and Huntsville, uh, with their fifth penalty has to convert to send it to, to our fifth taker. And, uh, Jonathan Burke makes a, makes a great save with this trailing leg, uh, to secure the extra point, to secure the shootout victory and breezy on a day when, you know, you're 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 putting two goalkeepers on the bench. You are just getting a few guys their first action at Finley Stadium in front of fans. You're missing players. You could have easily gotten zero points. You also like could have gotten fortunate and gotten all three. You come away with two points. Six starters uh, down. With six starters down and the vibes, like the shootouts are dumb. It's a dumb rule. But the vibes are unbelievably high. Bingo. And, uh, and 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 not a. Uh, I mean, like the guys worked their asses off. Like they 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 played hard. The the possession game w- w- was good. Um, and and maybe we just move it. We we move into the match discussion. You know, here I thought we held possession really well. I think it. I think Fotbob tracked it to about sixty forty. We don't have yet. Uh, good uh, next pro statistical data yet for for some categories. Uh, I looked into it. Apparently, there was some issue with the data provider that they're working on getting sorted. Um, but like, we also did not generate a ton of chances until until Medi's substitution, and Huntsville had the had the better of the play. And I would say that a large a large portion of their better chances was because of us. It was because of like early season CFC with a lot of new faces making mistakes that led to opportunities on the other end. And we saw this in, in, in on Tuesday night in the open cup as well. We also saw it last um, year against Valley United, uh, something that, that you, I think two, two years ago. Two, uh, and and sorry, let's talk about ago. that. Let's talk about that at, at the very end of the overall. Um, what I, what I really was interested in uh, is like, you could tell that the refereeing quality in the game was different. Just being with pro two, out of like the the local assigners was a massive difference. Like that, the, the referee had ref pro games before. I don't know uh, if a I would, huge crowd. I don't know if I would call it a massive difference, but like is, a noticeable it was difference. massive difference. Um, just like I mean, it was a huge crowd, like 43, 50, whatever it was, like forty three, you know, a lot of emotion, a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff going on, and they it didn't seem like they didn't shut down or seem over. Like they, I, th- I felt like they they managed the game fairly well. Um, and yeah, it was, it honestly, it was a great vibes day and it was a great tailgate. Uh, the Huntsville supporters that came out were, were fantastic. There was a player family that came out like, uh, a Huntsville player family. You know, yes. The, yeah. A in Huntsville player Cal- family came in, out like in from California, really, really fantastic for the vibes. Uh, and, and of course, when you get on a super big high, sometimes it can come crashing down pretty fast. And that leads us into Tuesday night, first round of the U.S. Open Cup. Uh, Miami United, our old our old foes, come to town, and it was just not a great night. Uh, so let me do the lineup. Uh, in in case you're living under a rock, CFC goes down one to nil in the twelfth minute. That remained the score uh, for the, the for the the remainder of the match. Jonathan Burke in goal. Robert Screen at right back. Uh, so one cha- three changes from the weekend. Robert Screen at right back. Anatoly Prepolitsa at right center back. 
Farid Zarzar going into the match at left center back to replace Logan Brown. Joseph Perez at left back again. Uh, Aaron Zazu at, at the six. Alex McGrath at one of the tens. Callum Watson replaces Luis Garcia Sosa. Um, Milo Garvanian uh, back at right uh, at right uh, winger. Taylor Gray back at left winger. And then Ethan Corrin started again at the nine. Uh, right off the bat. First off. Right off the, I was say, right off the bat, like, Ethan was really effective in game one in a lot of ways, I think, because we went up first um, and we weren't chasing the game. Um, so that that meant like, you know, his he has a lot of defensive and running abilities. I'm sure he was tired and maybe that showed a little bit. But in general, like he did a ton of pressing and and a couple times like he knocked the ball that was just really close to I mean, there's one in particular where it came over the top and somebody almost got to it. Like he did a ton of running. But since they scored in the 12th minute. Uh, we needed him to score for us after that. And that is not, um, no offense to Ethan, but that is not a center back playing strikers uh, best play to be chasing the game with a more or less bunkered team. And you have to go try to score. Yeah. I think it's the difference between a game that's 60, 40 in possession like Huntsville and a game that ended up being 75, 25 in possession uh, in, in favor of CFC, the the responsibilities are just a little bit different, and what you're being asked to do is a little bit different. And and so, like, I don't think it's a terrible surprise that that Ethan struggled more with that with that responsibility. And and, and this is no again no shot. Like, it's not surprising. Like, he is a center back. Puppies. He is not a nine. He's certainly not a back to goal nine. And uh, and also, you know, he came off. I think cramping a little bit in, after the Huntsville game. And now you're turning around three days later and you're playing again. That's it's just incredibly tough. Uh, I'll go note at the beginning of the starting lineup there, Robert screen starting at right back because Jesse Williams is on international duty with Trinidad and Tobago. Um, Shout out Jesse. Good luck this uh, Thursday. Yeah. Tomorrow. Go, go, go crush the Canadians uh, on whatever day you play on Saturday. I think it is. I think it's, uh, I think it's, t- I think it's tomorrow. I don't believe so. Or Friday. Because, Saturday. Because, but then if they play on I'm, Saturday, they they would just play directly again on Sunday? Keep going. I'll, I'll pull it up. I think it's single leg. Pretty sure it's single leg. Um, no, but I'm going, got, I'm going to the U.S. game. If we beat Jamaica on Thursday, we're in the final on Sunday. The final's on Sunday. Yeah, but you guys, you, we're, we're, playing, we're talking about something completely different here. Uh, that's a semifinals thing, not, a, not another thing. In any case, uh, I'll note out here that uh, Callum Watson uh, starts started the uh, at midfield for Luis Garcia Sosa. I think he got subbed out in the 69th minute, probably on a minutes restriction there. Um, and you know you're managing Luis's minutes coming off of three days of rest with another game on on the weekend. And in this one, Medi was able to go 27 minutes plus stoppage time. Uh, Jesus Sabaro and Jalen James make their appearances in the 80th minute, and that's when we shifted into a, a full-on back three, uh, trying to different. push a little bit more numbers forward. Uh, yeah, but it also not not that not dissimilar from some games last year, where Rob would switch to a back three with about 10 minutes left in regulation if we were down a goal in chasing. Uh, I only have one real like specific thought about this game, a lot more general ones, but like we look tired. Uh, we look leggy. We look not sharp. Uh, I'm not terribly surprised with any of this. Uh, and I'm not terribly surprised that, that Miami came out and, and were confident and, and, and sharp and, and really, um, really up for, uh, up for this first few minutes. Uh, even, even without the, the free kick, the absolute banger of a free kick that it was, um, you know, they had they had a couple opportunities early, including a, a tremendously glorious chance very very early uh, from a, from a giveaway, and a, you know a giveaway and build up, and and that's just, you know, I, I think you finish the first half at one nil, in and and their free kick is generous, uh, but they earn they earn some stuff by turning us over. And maybe it should be considered as more us giving the ball away. Um, but I want to, 
you know, I want to give them a little bit of credit on, on, on that front for, for coming out and, and stacking numbers, you know, between, between the lines and making it really hard for us to play through, uh, more, more than anything. Um, breezy. I'm here. What are your thoughts on, on doing a bit of a mailbag? I think there's some questions in here that will let us talk about, you know, kind of a specific game or multiple games here. And then we'll get into our final kind of three thoughts uh, and wrap this thing up with our remaining <laughs> like 12 and a half minutes. That sounds good. I was looking at, uh, I was looking to try to figure out, wow, I think I'm lagging behind on the video. Um, I was trying to figure out what the deal was for this weekend and the, um, the playing game and the, who was doing what and what was happening, but I couldn't figure, I couldn't make heads. I don't know. It. Also, if you want to be, be a little bit prepared here with our very short amount of time, you might need to create a second one of these and record that one and then uh, splice them together. We'll just, yeah, if this one ends, we'll start it over and I'll have to restart it. Because I can't do two at one okay. time because Zoom is silly and I'm not yeah, paying for crazy. it. Yeah, it's crazy. So let's do, let's do a mailbag here. Uh, and that'll allow us to talk about the games because I don't want to belabor Miami too much. Uh, and I'd rather talk about like like bigger picture first two games of the season. And there's two more to go before a big break. Uh, and that might lead in, into some interesting discussion. So uh, Justin Pizarro asks a question. Update on Jude, Jude Arthur, hmm. and any idea when to expect a full starting 11? Um, so I'll tell you from my perspective, last I heard, Jude Arthur is waiting for his visa. And we saw that Medi turned around, from what we understand, his visa and getting here and getting his medical done in between seven to ten days. Um, so he got the he got the visa and he literally flew out like within 48 hours and was here. Um, so hopefully that's the same. And then it took about three days to get the medical done, get him into practice. Depends on the weekend falls, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, you know, I it has been indicated to me that he is in preseason still with his other team. So he should come in pretty fit. But just because you come in fit does not mean you can start day one for Rod. Um, it also may be that you're good enough to do it, right? But you have to know what to do and how to do it in Rod's system. Rod's system is not an easy system to play in. Um, I think you saw that over the last two years. Um, it's a good system, but it takes takes a little bit of effort and, and time to learn. Um, so I'm not saying Jude won't be able to, but if Jude starts off on the bench for a few games or he starts out and he's not as good, like or any of these guys start out and they're not as good, like remember, it's it's a complicated and difficult system to play in. So when will we first see our uh, our regular quote unquote starting eleven, or our predicted starting eleven, or the one that we would have predicted in the preseason? Which, by the way, we still haven't done uh, a preseason thing. Hopefully, we will in the next little bit. Um, it won't actually be preseason. Uh, I'm guessing it is after the in that break that we have mid April. We have basically two and a half weeks potentially without a game. Early, early, early April. What did I say? Mid. Got it. Um, my bad. So the early. Yeah, I, the I early, expect it'll be that's I think inner Miami too. the end. Yeah. The end of that break is when I think we will probably or potentially see that um, that full starting 11. But even then, if we don't I mean, see it yet, look, Jean's coming off of a long injury. Not that Jonathan Burke can't play. We just all kind of assumed because Jean started all last season. that He'd be the guy playing like is his knee going to be ready? I don't know. Like, who's going to be playing at that right wing position? Is it Carlos Rivas? Is it um, Damian? Is it Jesus? Is it somebody else? Is it Jalen James? I don't know. Um, is Medi going to be 90 minutes fit or is Rivas going to start over Medi potentially? Um, I, there's just a, there's a few more. There's a few more things up in the air on what that starting 11 is going to be like. Um, but you can see Duvon and, and Farid coming into fitness now. Farid starting the the Miami United game and Duvon being getting a little play the other day, Callum starting like you're seeing some of the wheels turn towards getting us there. But yeah, that's what I'm thinking is in that break. We may see it all before then, but I think that's the break when it start. Everybody starts coming together and think about it two two and a half weeks for rod to practice starters, quote unquote, versus not first team versus second team um, all throughout practice. Let those guys get time together, spend, you know, five days a week, practicing every day, learning the system, learning the, you know, going through the rod sess. Like that's, uh, that's the reason I would project that period of time. Yeah. I, I, I definitely think it'll be the Saturday home game on April 13 versus inner Miami too. If you look at where we are right now, we're going to play FC, FC Cincinnati two on, on Saturday, follow that up with 
uh, New York City to away on Wednesday the 27th. And then it's a two and a half, a two and a half week break uh, with, with no matches until until the 13th. Um, I, I believe that uh, Jude should be here and, and ready to go by then. Um, I don't think the transfer executes until or payment executes or however that works until like he actually passes his medical. So, and that has to be here uh, when, when that happens. So, you know, I think that that break is going to do us some good. There's an interesting question in here, um, but I, I I think it's going to be a fight in words question for us. So I want to I want to wait on it a little bit. Um, but I do I, I do I'll note that Breezy, you kind of covered Kyle Johnson's question here about is Gene hurt? Good to see Burke get minutes, but I expected Gene to play the home opener during the cup. Yes, um, he had like a meniscus thing he sure. got surgery for in, er, early in the off season, and that's a long recovery, and you know, it was really good to see him go through the warm up um, and, and be named to the bench on 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 Saturday for the home opener. Can I, can I let you? Um, in he on? was not named. Can I let he you? He was in not named secret? to the team on on Tuesday night. Can I let you in on a little secret? Yes, he was on the bench, but there's a reason there was two goalkeepers on the bench. He wasn't going to play. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and so, he was and not that, on the bench look, for. He is, he is back in training. He is back in training. My understanding, he's back in full training, but I might have misunderstood. I spoke with him briefly, um, but somebody on the coaching staff told me, like, hey, he was on the bench. Like, we had him. It made sense. We're decimated with injuries right now, though, so we wanted to fill out a full bench. He was there, but, like, look, if something happened, like, I'm I'm now paraphrasing, but, like, Mike would have played, essentially, if something would have happened, because John yeah. is just not quite there. His knee's not quite there. Um, I think he might yeah. tell you otherwise, but, like, the coaching staff is taking a very long-term, smart approach with this, and that's good. That's how we want it to happen. It sucks to not have starters in any capacity back, potentially. But, look, this is a long season, and we want to win the Cup, not rush somebody back to hopefully get a better shot at a game early. Yeah, it's it's why it's why Gene's not available yet. It's why Medi's not going, is not starting in an open cup match yet. Like there are there's responsibilities that we have to do. Uh, and and I think there's some good questions in here that we should Keep we on. should talk about about the 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 and actually Ross asks a great one right now. And I'll note the time for for you breezy at the top there. I see it. How do you better pre- prepare from a squad perspective for the beginning of the season? And I, and I think he's talking about injuries. I think he's talking about you know visa guys not getting, uh, not getting a lot of time and being on minutes restrictions this early. Um, I will note one thing. That we knew when the regular season was going to begin. Uh, right, we did not know until quite recently when the Open Cup was going to begin. Division th- three teams have entered in the third round. Uh, or I'm sorry, the second round, the beginning of April, since the Open Cup format was changed uh, to have the tournament start in March and not in uh, and not in early May, right? So that comes as a bit of a, a bit of a surprise. We would still be a little bit in trouble uh, because you know we have a Saturday game versus Huntsville, and we have a Saturday game versus FC Cincinnati too, but adding an Open Cup game in there in the first round really comes at a bad time for us and because it was scheduled two weeks ago you know there's there's no planning that can go into it because we just have no idea there was no communication from u.s soccer we know that mls and u.s soccer had been talking for for a long time about about you know the cup uh and it's undeniably made the cup worse and Thanks, it's MLS. also like hurt it also hurt us in in that process uh so like that's just reality, um, and and I think the the bigger question is, you know, I think we need to have our, our our transfer business done in the future. We need to have that transfer business probably done earlier. We need we need that month that it sometimes takes or usually takes between contract signing and actually getting a person in to start training. It's been it's been shaken out to be about a month, like actually like physically here and starting training after the medical process. We need that to happen probably by January 1, if we're going to have preseason at February 1. So I have... Uh, uh, and I, that's a good that's a good lesson to learn. I got takes on this. Um, so yeah, I think 
like you said, we've got lessons to learn, right? This is our first time having P1s. Also, because it was our first time having P1s, we had seven slots and nobody, um, okay, we had two guys that, that we, and Anatoly and, and Gene, as our understanding is, those two guys qualify as international spots. They don't qualify as domestic players. They did qualify as domestic in Nisa. However, I would guess, so we know that a lot of these guys are on two-year deals with a club option. Um, I would guess in the future, we're not going to have seven, or we're not going to have seven spots to fill. We're going to have two or three probably per off season, yeah. maybe even one or two sometimes. And so, yes, we have to be better. Clearly we have to learn. Uh, we have to go through this process, but sometimes the opportunities don't come early. Um, and it's a hard balance to strike. I think if I could ask for us to do something differently, yes, you, uh, we need to have the vast majority of our, <coughs> excuse me, international players in and set by January 1st. No, no question. However, it's just not realistic in year one, and it's not realistic every year. We see this in USL. We see this in MLS sometimes where you they don't have an international guy or two. It's not usually seven, but a guy or two. And we don't, I, clearly, we don't have seven out. But um, it's, not, it's not a common thing to fill this many spots in one offseason, and it yeah. took a little while. Also, don't forget, for Jude Arthur is coming in to replace Richard Dixon, a, a signing we were not expecting to make, a signing that we right. find out found out we had to make midway through the preseason when um, the, the medical test discovered that, that thing with Richard. So, And then he chose to retire. So that is like – that. The, it's just a really tough situation. Do I want to see us operate a little differently in the future? Yes, I do. Um, but I'm not going to like lambast Rod and the, and the team for quote unquote doing it wrong because like you're doing it for the first time and our backs were very much uh, against the walls. We were very much put against a, a weird situation, a tough situation. So we need to be filling, better about it. Excuse me. Filling two spots is vastly different than filling five spots, Bingo. for example. Also, and I'll note that Jesse Williams, that signing was done in, in the end of December and and he was you know like his was ready to go and like in in through he was there day one, so you know we had four we had four that we were behind on and one that we never were expecting to make, and I think that's that's the big difference and it's a it's unlikely to, a, a situation that's unlikely to repeat itself in that kind of number. Let's pause right here, start a new meeting, and we'll be yep. right back. A few moments later. Well, before we were so rudely interrupted. Um, do we finish that question, do you feel like? Yeah, we're good. We'll let's move on. By the way, that's a great fucking question. Yeah, you, you big, I, I agree. You big, big nerd. <laughs> that's some shit. That's some shit I you and me would, would ask and talk about. So I I fucking love that question. Exactly. Okay, let's uh Bill Oltred's got a, a series of questions here. Uh, um I think we combine, I think the, are... combine the first two. Okay. Can do, can do. I'll, I'll, uh, read, so I'll read them. Just... I'll read them and ask you this time. I'll let you go first, so I'm not bloviating as much. Uh, Matthew, do you think we came out flat in the Open Cup, or were we just outplayed? Like, what hurt us the most? Was it players we had available? Miami's defensive strategy, refereeing mistakes. Um, by the way, we called them Nisa referees, and it was very funny. Uh, or whimsical first touches all game long. Yes. <laughs> I mean, like, frankly, the answer is the answer is yes. Like to all of it. Uh, we were flat. We were we were leggy. Um, you you know how like like in preseason you, you that first game is not remotely like your your last game because you ratchet up the intensity, you ratchet up the amount of minutes with intensity that you have. Um, I I think the I think we were we were prepared for for Saturday's match against Huntsville in terms of like the, the, the proper intensity and, and whatever. And I think Tuesday's match coming, coming three days after uh, uh, we were just not as prepared. I think because we were, we were not just fully recovered uh, from a match of that kind of intensity on Saturday. And you couple that with Miami, who's a good team, right? It makes it, that's the kind of game that makes you prime for an upset. And that's before we talk about this whole six starters thing, right? Um, so, like, yes, we were flat. Yes, we were outplayed. Although I, I would contend it was us making our own, our, our own mistakes, much like Saturday, um, that that really caused us to be in in a tough position. And 
you know, that's that that's part of it. Yeah, our first our first touch wasn't good. Yes, the referee was awful. Um, and I don't think the referee is what caused us to, to lose that game. I think the referee could have helped us out a, a good amount. Um, you know, what what the the Miami player did to Milo on, on one of those corners was disgraceful. Um, and I mean, like, it's, it's a full on chokehold dragging him down. Like, I don't know if he hit his head on the ground or on the post, uh, but it, it's just disgusting stuff. Like that's a penalty in a red guard. Um, there's a moment in, and I don't know if it's in stoppage time or, or in the eighties somewhere, um, uh, where, where like Medi physically dominates a guy with his back to goal, lays the ball off and is turning to make a run in behind. Yep. And the center back head hunts him, knocks him down. It's not shoulder to shoulder. It's not he, like he takes like a perpendicular line, head hunts the guy. And the referee is just like, nope, I didn't say anything. Play on. Like that is disgusting. And it's also a red card because it's probably dog so. Because if that ball connects, you know, yes, there's an outside back and there's another center back kind of sort of in the line. But if that ball connects, it's just Medi on on the keeper one on one, like the chance that he had uh that you put just wide in the in the 67th minute or whatever it was. Uh it, it's just it's just nasty stuff. It's typical Miami. But it's just nasty stuff. And and that's a referee that's just not prepared for for that kind of environment and that kind of game. And you get all these things that happen. It's also, and, and, and there's it's also possible that we understood it was Miami. We understood the kind of players they are and, and the kind of game they play. And given our situation with the injuries coming off of a game three days later, it's entirely possible that we pulled out of some challenges that we didn't want to get hurt, that uh, that we couldn't kind of play through it a little bit, and and I think that also like made our our job more difficult, and and I I think all of these factor in, and it, and it's a prime example why you know a pro team can sometimes get upset by an amateur team like it happens every year in the open cup we saw right? this we saw the like, same vermont scored vermont scored three goals in a row uh on lexington not just an hour after after our game started like this is this is a regular thing that happens it's 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 also the same thing that like i i mean i predicted this pregame not that we would lose but that like seven the first 75 minutes of every open cup game against an amateur team like the amateur team is more up for it and it is tough because they are potentially just as good as you potentially and it's always the last 15 minutes where they fade every single time physically fade because they're not pros they're not training every day they're not the same level of fitness we saw it in this game we just didn't get the goal at the end that doesn't make it okay but you saw like with 15 minutes left in that game like we were dominating and we just couldn't get it done that's not me defending it i'm not saying it's okay but that is the reality of the open cup um pro teams versus amateur teams is some of the magic I, of the cup as yeah. well we've been that listen, i, I think we've one been of the, this like, team before we've been the team upsetting people and it sucks that it's miami and it sucks this was their super bowl but we weren't good enough and we have to be better no and you know i i think i think this team will be fundamentally different and and this is actually a good question let's move into it uh, Bill continues and he asks, any adjustment, any adjustments you guys want to see going forward? Uh, and I'm just going to give my standard personnel as policy answer. Like, I just want everybody to get healthy. I want everybody to get in. I want everybody to get fit. Um, I have said, we said on a, on a podcast going into the start of the season that this team was going to be fundamentally different in game one to game five. Uh, which is inner Miami too. This team will also be different game five to game 20. And I think we have to respect that, that process. It sucks that these, that the open cup happened earlier, you know, two weeks, two weeks or whatever, earlier than it, it, it should have. Right. Uh, and it sucks that we were less prepared for that, but also like, this is what happens. Like sometimes the pro beat and knocked out in the first round of the cup. Like and, and and it finally happened to us. This is the first time. I think this is the first time in CFC history where we have been knocked out of the open cup by a team 
lower in the division than us. Um, and if I go, if I go pull up the game document for CFC's entire history, I'm going to wager that we've won like three of these or four of these games against teams at a, at a higher division. Um, like sometimes, you know, sometimes it finally happens to you. Um, and that sucks, but that's all okay. And, and I'm willing, I wasn't there in the stadium, so I did not get the emotion of the drums and, and, and the, the singing and like physically being there. Right. Uh, me watching a game in a hotel room is, is a vastly different experience. Um, so I can rationalize it a lot, a lot easier without, without some of the extra emotional bits from that, that I would have from being there. And we, we were exactly a team that was ripe for an upset given all the factors going on, even before you get into the Miami being a, a fairly good team. And what was really encouraging for me in that game is that, you know, we subbed on, when we were able to sub on Medi, an actual forward, you know, just his presence there helped open up, uh, open up some passing lanes in the middle for the midfielders to be able to find some gaps and get on the ball, his ability to hold up the ball and bring other players into the game uh, allowed us to advance further forward uh, on the field uh, closer to the, the opposition box uh, compared to large portions of that, of that game before he subbed on where we were not able to do that very much. And we were not able to do that very much against Huntsville either. So those are really good signs going forward that the like that the elements of what is needed to be successful in this tactical system are there we just simply need to get you know medi needs to be 90 minutes fit we need carlos's itc to come in uh we need our starting goalkeeper back you know jesse williams on international duty we'll we'll get him back hopefully for new york city uh right you know getting duvan uh a massive ball playing center back from, from Columbia, getting him integrated in. Um, I think we're missing, I think we're missing Richard Dixon on the field. Um, you know, an experienced player. He's guys, he's, he's played nearly, I think he played 200 matches over 200 matches in his pro career. Uh, nearly a hundred of them for CFC, not quite. And, you know, you were missing him at the six, you're missing a true six on the field. Uh, someone like a Jude Arthur, you know, we're, we're missing some of the, hopefully getting some of those wingers back. Uh, it's just, I don't think Rod's going to blow up the system. I really don't. I think, I think the system has flaws in the early season, uh, especially with a bunch of new players and, and some guys playing a bunch of guys playing out of position. And, you know, this is going to be my first key takeaway. I'm just going to go ahead and get it out of the way now, even though we have one more question uh, that I think you and I are going to fight about. Some of y'all didn't watch the Valley United game in 2022, and it shows. Uh, and I realized it was on 11. I realized that 15 people were on that stream. I realized that 11 of us were in the bar at the same time when it happened. And So probably like a don't maximum forget, of 26 people watched that game. Don't forget the camera was 150 yards further back than normal. But some of y'all didn't watch Valley United. And it shows. Uh who beat the ever living fuck out of us. Uh, game finished nil nil. We had a chance to win. We should have lost. We should have lost. Uh, the XG was probably not pretty. The, you know, we were, we were making mistakes and build up. We were giving the ball away. Guys were, were at least like a full second off in and, and their timing and their, and their movements where they expected their teammates to be. We saw that against, against Huntsville and we saw that against Miami. And when you are in a ball possession system and your timing is off, your awareness of who's supposed to be where, when, and not even in terms of like Antonio Conte pattern play, because we don't really do a lot of patterns. Um, the, the announcer, Ricky Lopez Espen, who will do some MLS games? I'm I'm pretty sure. Uh, next some next pro games in uh, and does a bunch of USL games. Former USL player, like he's wrong about that in, in terms of CFC specifically. We don't do patterns. 
Um, it's about guys like figuring out movements, making little decisions every single second about where they should be, when they should be there. Where's the ball probably going to go? So where should I be for the next pass? Right? Matthew, we're not there. Why the fuck were you watching with the audio on? You know better. Because I wanted to hear you guys. Okay, thanks, buddy. Because because you guys were loud and it was rowdy and it was fun and I could hear your voice specifically a few times. Uh, I was. Uh, you can hear my voice right now. It's pretty. Um, it's a few notches yeah, lower. Rancid. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, there there are these. We're just like we're not there yet. It's not a tactical thing. It's really not. It's a personnel thing, and until you get proper personnel, especially at the forward positions, with with all due respect to Ethan and Milo, it makes not having options available, uh, like regular options, like like many sized options available at the forward, affects what the the center backs do which affects what the, the midfielders do, which affects how we can play through that. And, you know, I, I think that's that's something that we're going to see change over time. And, uh, and, yeah, so, no, no adjustments. Just personnel, Bill. Just personnel. Yeah, I'm not going to go as long as Matthew. I'm just going to say like, it's just personnel. It might be it might be tactical later, but missing six six people that we expect to be starting differently um, in both these games or six and five, however you want to classify it, like we just sh- we just don't know what we are. We have no idea what we are. Um, just don't know. So we'll know more later on. But I don't I don't have any adjustments I want to see. I just want to get see guys get fit and guys start playing together. Um, so that they can get better. But we, as Matthew said, with Valley United, I agree with that. Like, it is the trusting the rod test part. You got to, like, trust that some bumps and bruises are going to happen earlier on in the season. It sucks that we had one must-win game in four and we fucked it up. That sucks. But that's soccer. You and that's, play the games. and that's the cup. Got to play the games. Um, and that's any and that's any cup tournament, right? Uh, in any single elimination tournament, like, if you don't have it on that day or you don't prioritize the cup or, like, whatever, whatever thing— could easily get knocked out. Um, and it just happened to us. I will note one more thing. It's it's not all 100% personnel. We did see some adjustments happen in the game itself. We saw Taylor Gray trying to move centrally a little bit to, to combine a little closer with Ethan Korn. We saw Milo do the same thing. And that allowed, that forced some of the, like, the center midfielders uh, to, to occupy more specifically people as opposed to spaces. And that did allow some of our, our midfielders to end up in better and bigger pockets of space for our center backs to play into um, between lines and gaps. There were some adjustments that, that were made and, and obviously like Medi Medi's inclusion in the second half helped that a lot, even more. Um, so I want to see more of that. Uh in, when 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 the time is right, and I think you you'll just see a little bit more, you know the the system the system as it's built is with you know sometimes a box with two center backs. Let's see where's the where's the camera there? A box with two center backs and kind of two midfielders, one of which is actually the the an outside back. I'm gonna and I'm then gonna, another one's kind of flared I'm gonna, off. I'm gonna stop you right there because we don't know what that's gonna look like. That's what it's looked like for now when we're playing essentially three eights. Like you don't know what that's going to look like in the pre- in the season. You can't make comments on tactics right now. You can make comments on the, what we've done in the preseason in, in one and a half games, but like we don't have we don't know with Jude Arthur. Do we go back to just a straight sitting six that sits there and, and everybody possible. else runs around? I think that's likely, but who the fuck knows? Like we just with with six players missing or five players missing or seven players missing, depending on your calculations of which game it is. We just don't fucking know. You don't know. That's fair. While, but, get, while getting adjusted to a new league, it may be best to not be as congested with players not fully available and out on international duty. This gives us a good two and a half week spell after the NYC game to regroup and hopefully give everyone get everyone in and game fit. So is last night's games lo- again, last night's loss? I can't read actually a win for the group in the long run, Bill. I know what yes. you're I know what you're gonna say. 100 percent yes. Fuck off. 
It just is. Fuck off. No, it's not. <laughs> no <laughs> like, loss. No loss is a win. No loss is a win. It's not. It absolutely. Another game. I'll give you the. I'll let you. I'll, I'll, let, you, I'll, let, you, I'll let you go. I'll let you I'll go. I'll give you the non-emotional reason. By the way, the emotional reasons are good enough that the cup matters and we should want to win. Uh, I'll give you that. I won't even give you any financial reasons because we could have hosted an MLS team or who the hell knows what else. But here's why it matters: because another game, game time playing, getting players in and getting players more minutes together in that stretch, we'll still have would have had two weeks off. It just wouldn't have been two and a half weeks off. We would have had a whole other time for guys to get minutes. We needed that game. We could have used that game. It could have potentially been a home game. It's not good. And and losing is never good, guys. Never. I In a cup competition. I understand in a regular season you can make that argument. Hey, and I've made that argument. We've made that, we've made that argument many times. Trust the rod sess. Like, time's going to go. It's going to put – there's no trusting the rod sess when in a knockout tournament. When you're in a knockout tournament, it's win or go home. And when you don't win, that is not good, period. There is no other bullshit about having an extra three days to practice. Fuck that shit. Uh, it's not an extra three days. It's a week and a half uh, if you if you do win uh, with more more schedule congestion later on. And we'd have to move uh, we'd have to move a regular season game if you win that round two game. Listen, it sucks to lose in a knockout tournament. It sucks to lose in the first round. It sucks to lose to an amateur team. Um, all of those things are true. This particular group needs more time and they need more time on the practice field. Um, because you're looking at you're if you're, if you're playing that round two game, you know, you're in a better position because it's a week after the New York city game and you have a little bit of time afterwards, but like, then you're then you're focusing on play, playing games and you're not in training and we need to be in training right now. Uh, this this set of games at the beginning of the season is is four games, or I'm sorry, it's one game straight up Huntsville, and then it's three consecutive games on short rest. Uh, that is rough. It's not good for this team right now. It's not good for 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 betting some of these new guys in. Um, and in the long run, it will probably benefit this team a lot. Uh, there's a reason why teams in, in whether they're in MLS or th there's a reason why MLS teams that are in CONCACAF and that make a CONCACAF Champions League run often struggle in the MLS regular season in the first half of the year. And sometimes it, it mostly kills them for the entire season. Look at New England Revolution's record right now. I don't think they have any points, uh, but they're they're still advancing in CONCACAF. Seattle Sounders last year were, uh, I mean, they won the CONCACAF Champions League, but the amount of extra games that they had to play, it decimated them in the MLS regular season. And that continued all the way through the fall. Uh, I, think, I think Jeremy would tell you uh, that the Open Cup absolutely matters and, and you want to advance and you, and you want to, to win and advance as far as you can, but it had effects on that St. Louis team that he had in his last year when they made it to the quarterfinals. So I think, I think in, in this, in this year specifically, I'm not going to worry about it too much because I think, I think this team in its first year in MLS next pro it's first year at what is, what is undeniably a higher level than NISA. What is uh, in a situation where you have guys on P1 visas for the first time, which we could not have before. All of these things mean that we really need to get down to business in in April. You're, and you're and telling me for, that for the rest of the season. You're telling me the second the, our second open round, uh, cup game would have come right in the center of a two and a half week break. Uh, a week after New York, and then a week and a half before before Miami. You are out of your fucking mind if you think that was bad scheduling. We complained about having three weeks off before the tournament two years ago. We don't. We we've talked about how rusty we come in when we have too much time off. It it set up fucking perfectly to be right in the middle where you and you, you when you're training you're training for games too by the way you're not just training training in the preseason the guys are mostly fit the guys need to get game shape and get ready that is an asinine take about schedule congestion i it could have been true later on 
okay, we're doing a little skip and Shannon here, but like this is just it could have been this true is, later this on. This is a team. If we win the second round, sure, maybe then it fucks up schedule congestion, whatever else. But you are out of your fucking mind if you think this was a bad scheduling fixture congestion issue. It came right in the middle. It would have helped us. It would have given us something to do during those. It would have given us something to train for. And look, if it's if it, if the next rounds had happened, yeah, sure, maybe. But there's no guarantee those would have happened. It could not have fallen for us better uh, scheduling wise. And you're out of your fucking mind. This is a team that needed a second preseason, and it's going to get we one. We still would have had going one. To benefit this team. We would have no. A, we would no, have had a week miss and me a with half. That. We would have absolutely, absolutely still had a second it's preseason. Not the, it's not the same. This this is gonna this is gonna end up benefiting us later on. Uh, However, however, the the embarrassment from a first round loss hurts. It just will. Losing is never okay. Losing in a knockout tournament is never, never okay. Uh, what are your other takeaways? Because we're not going to agree. On this. Uh, you want to do my back and forth anymore? <laughs> uh, it's been a long, it's been a long time three... since you were this wrong on something. By the way. By the way, it's just you being wrong. I'm always right. Let's do your three key takeaways first, and then I'll come back with my next two once I write them. Yeah. So, uh, look, cup sets suck. That's my first one. Um, we've been there before. We've usually been the team doing the upsetting, um, as you pointed out earlier. It just didn't go our way. Um, I'm going to be sad about this, but, like, this has no bearing on the rest of the season, um, like, on the field. It has an emotional bearing on the rest of the season, but, like, we're going to be all right. It just it sucks. It, it Losing sucks. And, but also like, this is the magic of the cup. This is why you do it. The open cup is undeniably good. And, uh, hopefully next year we're, we make a Cinderella run and go beat some MLS teams. It just didn't go our way this year. Um, look, Saturday was magical. Uh, the vibes were great. Um, we talked about the kids, like the 4,300 people, the excitement for being in a new league and a new chapter um, for Chattanooga Football Club and for, for the Chattahooligans and for all CFC fans and for the greater just Chattanooga community. Like everybody had a new piece of, of the pie to to be excited about. And so um, that was a weird analogy, but you get where I'm going. It was wonderful. Um, the vibes could not have been better. It, several people told me that it felt like, you know, pre-pandemic vibes, um, pre-2018 vibes even. And like, look, the vibes back in those days when we were making really, really deep playoff games were pretty immaculate. Or really deep playoff runs, excuse me, were pretty immaculate. So um, I agree with, I don't know that I would say the vibes have been bad since then, but I do agree the vibes were top notch. And so I want those to continue. I can't wait for Saturday. Can't wait to go again. I can't wait to get out of these three o'clock games, though. Um, I prefer the seven o'clock kickoffs. And uh, yeah, I'm, you know, look, as, as low as yesterday was, Saturday was that same high. That was that was the they were the opposite end of the spectrum, and guys trust the process support the boys like this is uh, a tough this is a tough loss it sucks nothing has changed we are we are out there for a long season we are trying to be the best team in MLS Next Pro we are trying to win a title um, we were trying to win an Open Cup title didn't happen okay move move on one game does not make this our second game. Like, I understand it hurts. I understand it feels bad. But, like, trust the Rod says. We have seen it. We have two years uh, of coaching our team, and we have a whole, him having a whole other year where we've seen that the team that starts the season is not the team that finishes the season. And just have faith in that. Personnel-wise, tactics-wise, playing-wise, everything. Trust. Trust the Rod says. Yeah. My my second takeaway is is more broadly summed up. We aren't now who we will be uh on the field we're not who we will be later on uh rod's teams tend to progress uh especially with, with this many new pieces it took some considerable time for that 2022 group to really like get the to get the system to start to understand and to start to, to rack off some wins and you know, and, and and progress isn't linear either. So like, there's going to be some up, ups and downs, and and that's just part of it. Uh, but but ultimately, and this goes to point three. Okay, we're out of the open cup. So what is there left to do? It's, it's the league. It's MLS Next Pro. We need to, you know, in the Eastern Conference, eight teams make the playoffs. So goal number one is to rack up as many points as possible, win as many shootouts as possible when there's a draw, and get enough points to try to get a home game. And whether you're the the first seed or the eighth seed, you're just trying to make a run. 
um, and we'll have a better idea of who we are at that point in time. But ultimately, we're just trying to make a run. We're trying to go, you know, finish as high as we possibly can in the league in the regular season. Um, and then, you know, then you throw out the regular season and you just go try to make a run in the playoffs. And that's what this is about now. And and that and that's all that there's there's left. Uh, and, and like with a with a disappointing Open Cup uh, tournament being bounced in, in in the first round, there's just a little bit more importance now on the league. Not because it's the only thing that's left, but because no one's going to remember the Open Cup if you're hosting a trophy at the end of the season, right? No one's going to remember. So let's go host a trophy at the end of the season. Like, let's do it. Um, and I'm excited to watch this team, to watch this team grow. This is this is going to be one of the most, like, formative years in in in, in CFC history, honestly. Um, and, and and there's so much stuff happening. If we if we if we take our gaze off off the field for, for a second, there's so much more happening behind the scenes in terms of the build out of the front office. The fact that we we pulled up, you know, forty three fifty at at the the home opener forty three seventy eight. Don't erase those or seventy two. Damn it, I think it's forty three seventy eight. <laughs> like the the Don't fact you that we erase had that those many extra twenty five ish people, Matthew. And, and shout out to the to the ticketing team uh, and to the corporate partnerships team that that also like worked with the ticketing team to like to really move that ball forward. The the new offerings at Finley Stadium in terms of the all inclusive for the for, for fruit for people that want that uh, the, the premium options. They're like we have doubled season ticket sales, right? Um, I think I think uh, Allison at the at the, uh, the the chalk talk event noted that we had doubled. Corporate partnerships. Um, he he didn't quite say that. He he said uh, his his announcement went this way, and so like you can read it. Hold on. Dogs are barking at the window. Nice that we attended. We <laughs> attempted to do one. And we started the new meeting. Here we are. Um, so he said they had doubled their goal of um, in in kind sponsorships. And they had oh, yeah. they had more than doubled their goal in not or maybe it was switched. Um, anyway, basically, like the what it sounded like to me, and and I don't want to put words in Alton's mouth. He, you know how you can you can switch numbers to like support anything you want. Um, so I, I want to be careful that we're not like thinking it's like some crazy things happening, but maybe it is. But basically, one of the numbers was doubled and one of the numbers was tripled. So we're we're at like double our projections for, um, let's say a cash corporate sponsorships and then or corporate partnerships rather and then we're at like triple in in kind um corporate partnerships so that is very the, whatever those numbers really truly are it sounds like they are big increases from last year and it's very 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 good and that, that is a positive for cfc uh sustainability long term and really a, a very good sign um going forward for for our club that we want to be the best club it can be yeah i yeah i can't i can't say yeah um, there was one other thing I was, I was going to, going to mention, you know, there's, there's, there's also a lot going on in terms of like, obviously there's, there's tons of, of, of money and investment going in. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we, we, every year we talk about some of our, our biggest goals, uh, whether they're long-term medium term, you know, is there, is there kind of long-term stadium stuff? Is there long-term player housing stuff? Like what, it, what is going on? We don't really know about any of that for, especially for the purposes of this, this podcast, but like, this is an incredibly exciting year because stuff is starting to happen. And, you know, don't, don't let, in my opinion, you, you can think whatever you want, listener, don't let, you know, a bad result on a Tuesday night, it's like 45 degrees, get you down on, on the possibilities of what this season could be. Uh this is going to be a good one, and it, it's maybe taking a little bit of time, but this is going to be fun. I would like to. I'm, I'm very excited, and I'm, I'm no less excited about about the rest of the season or Saturday Bingo. than I was before Tuesday. Absolutely not. I agree with if that. Any, if anything, I'm that. a little bit more excited just to be contrarian to the rest of y'all. 
there we go. That's what it is. Okay, so I want to uh, do a really, really quick uh, That's So Nisa segment. So it's something I wanted to bring back. I don't know if I'll continue to bring it back, but the Nisa season is about to start. In That's So Nisa, hashtag That's So Nisa news, the betting sites you could bet on the Open Cup for the first time that I know of. I am not a sports better, and here is why. I would fucking love it, and I would spend money, and I would lose money. So I don't do it. Um, yesterday is the first, genuinely, the first time I have regretted deeply not having sports bet. Matthew sent me a screen shot of someone who bet $50 on two NISA teams winning and they won $1,200. It is the exact same bet that I would have made, to be clear. The exact same bet I would have made with 100 bucks. I swear to you, I would have put $100, I would have made $2,000. Now, I don't know if they would have won if I would have put $100, I might have jinxed them. However, in the That's So NISA moment of the day, the NISA teams were favored to lose massively against amateur opposition. These teams also didn't even have the correct uh, titles of the, of the other team. The villages, I guess, have rebranded to Brave SC or Brave FC or whatever they are, but it still listed the villages. It was beautiful. It was magical. Nisa teams out there making some people money. I mean, you never know. Maybe the Asian betting markets were uh, were getting involved, as we uh, rumors we heard a few years ago. So for your first That's So Nisa segment of the 2024 season, hell yeah. I I wasn't even rooting for the NISA teams, but I love that somebody's making money off NISA teams winning in the Open Cup. And this that is, is so fucking Mike NISA. This is, this is friend of the pod, Mike Pendleton here, uh, who's a Tampa Bay Rowdy supporter. He took Savannah Clovers plus 575. It's so good! <laughs> Which is incredible. And then and then parlayed it with Maryland Bobcats plus 275. Uh, so the, both, the, of those, both of those were road teams, by the way. Yeah, Both yeah. Nisa teams were road so, teams. I want to be clear. The Savannah, the Savannah was a bet, right? I, the, the, the 575 line is insane, which is why I would have bet it. Um, and I, I know very little about sports gambling, but I know enough to know like that was a terrible line. The the upside there was too good to pass up. The Maryland is probably a uh, like similar to being right, like closer to being right, rather, like slightly not favored because they're going on the road. Just, just and, switch them. Correct. Just switch them. Correct. Well, no. No, 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 no. Maryland should have Maryland should have been favored. Like they had anyway. Yeah, Mar- Maryland should have been favored even on the road against an amateur team. Bingo, exactly. But they were neither team was favored. Both teams were under were dogs, and then you add them together, and you had a great odds play. Those are the yeah. kind of odds you get by doing like a five game parlay and some shit on on like the March Madness or whatever. Anyway, that, I will I will I will close fun. it with I will close it with this. There is an Open Cup game on Thursday night. Uh, that takes involves an amateur team and a USL League One club that I will not mention. The odds currently on that game, if you thought that Savannah plus 575 was crazy, now granted, this is the, the amateur team being the dog. It's sitting around plus 1,200. Plus twelve. Hundred. I personally know someone who's put put a fiver on that one. Uh, yeah, that is that is fun as well. Um, I all right. If if you if any listeners out there are musicians, uh, I know Eric and I have talked about this a little bit. Um, I would love a that's so Nisa five second jingle. Um, really really old timey and stupid. The dumber the better that I can put on my um, pads so that I can hit that every time we go to talk about that so Nisa because I want to talk about it just about every week. Um. Anyway, there's there's shout out there. Thank you, listeners. Thank you, viewers. Uh, this should be on YouTube. I hope you're watching this on YouTube. Possibly, if you're out, it's because I can't figure out Zoom. Um, but hopefully, you'll be watching this on YouTube uh, or possibly. Thank you. Sorry that we are not together. I know it is genuinely a worse show when we are not in the same room, especially if we're arguing. Um, but this was how it had to happen. Thank you, guys. Um, thanks for all you do. Thanks for as CFC fans making uh, this community the family I choose. And like Saturday ruled. Last night sucked, but it also ruled. And uh, yeah. Uh, there was there were some guys from out of town that were there in several different capacities, and every one of them was like, wow, this shit is special. You guys are fucking special. This is a different thing, and this is amazing. And I, I couldn't uh, echo that more. So anyway, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. We love y'all. Peace.